Recording in progress. All right. So, <clears throat> section uh, 6.1 <clears throat> the standard normal distribution, as we like to call it. <clears throat> it's normal. We have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And a wonderful little bell curve right there with zero in the middle. The y-axis is the probability of a particular outcome of C. <clears throat> and we got C on the horizontal axis. So it's a little bit different than that, but that really is pretty much how it works. A couple of things that we talked about yesterday. <clears throat> The area under that graph is equal to one. <clears throat> uh, you have an area equal to one half on the left side and on the right side too. <clears throat> so oh, that's two one halves together and you get one. And that's a nice thing because it's a probability distribution and that's what everything needs to sub to. All right, so <clears throat> we also made clear that area is equal to probability. <clears throat> In other words, the probability that if a randomly selected <clears throat> z-score falls between A and B is equal to the area that we calculate when we calculate that area there. <clears throat> so that's equal to the area, the probability. <clears throat> Let me just make that clear and put some pretty color in there. Area. Is equal to probability. <clears throat> and that's a very important uh, component or notion here. How do we calculate area? How do we calculate probability? <clears throat> we use the TI-83, excuse me, TI-84 tool, normal CDF. <clears throat> and we put in a lower and upper, a mean and a standard deviation. That is what that particular tool requires to work properly. <clears throat> Uh, by the way, I can't ask you to find a probability in most instances unless I give you the, uh, enough detail. So that's where we were uh, yesterday. <clears throat> Today, I'm going to go a little bit further and take a look uh, at another aspect here, something called uh, the notion of critical values and uh, finding scores. So this works with the standard normal distribution. This is where I'm going to introduce the topic, but it applies to any any normal distribution. So whatever I say here applies to all normal distributions, not just the standard normal distribution. So that's where we are. <clears throat> now, let me define, there's a, <clears throat> the notion of a critical value. A critical value is a value that uh, identifies significant outcomes either high or low. We've already seen this to some degree. It's very similar to <clears throat> the mean plus or minus two standard deviations. <clears throat> but while this particular expression, the mean plus or minus two standard deviations is very, very specific, <clears throat> we only use it here with two standard deviations. <clears throat> this is right, uh, this is much more, uh, much more uh, usable. 
in terms of what it is we're going to need to do. We're going to be able to define significant in a number of different ways. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> let me give you an example of what we mean. <clears throat> if I have my Z distribution, and again, it applies to pretty much all normal distributions. <clears throat> Extreme outcomes, high or low outcomes happen out here on the tails. In fact, <clears throat> we uh, actually refer to them uh, as the right tail and the left tail. <clears throat> and these guys here, these particular Z scores <clears throat> are critical values. Depending on the nature of what it is we are taking a look at, sometimes there's one, sometimes there's two, Sometimes there's one on the left, sometimes there's one on the right, sometimes there's two, one on each end. <clears throat> so what do we have that we're looking at here? It's the z-scores that are bigger than that particular z-score or z-scores that are smaller than that particular z-score <clears throat> where we have significantly I scores, and over here we have low scores. <clears throat> so these critical values are defined in terms of that particular notion that we have here. And I'm going to remind you that since Since significant scores depend on probability, <clears throat> we start with that. <clears throat> and work back to a Z score. So let me tell you exactly what it is I mean by this particular statement right here. I'm gonna go ahead and draw a couple of pictures <clears throat> and you'll get, the, uh, you'll get the idea. So consider this particular statement here. We want the Z score that separates the uh, highest 10% of scores from the rest. So we want a Z-score that separates the highest 10% of scores from the rest. This is why I say drawing these pictures is so gosh darn important because it really helps us <clears throat> it really helps us uh, visualize what's going on. And that's really very useful for this situation. It's not about graphing the graph in a mathematical sense. It's drawing a quick sketch to understand what's going to happen. So the highest 10% is defined by <coughs> that little bit, <coughs> excuse me, of area. So there's my critical value there. Now it's important to remember that since the total area under the graph is equal to one, the area that I'm actually looking for in terms of a 
<clears throat> decimal value is 0 0.10. So we're looking for this guy here. <clears throat> I'm given this value here, that is supplied. We've got to make that work to find the Z score. <clears throat> now, again, there are a couple of different ways of going about doing this. Um, I'm going to run through the keystrokes in just a moment, um, but for the sake of my presentation here, <clears throat> This Z score is equal to 1.282. <clears throat> now, how did I come up with this particular number? That's what the keystrokes on our calculator are going to be about. So, this, as we like to say, is the inverse problem. the inverse problem. And I mean inverse in that notion or sense of <clears throat> F <clears throat> inverse uh, that you encountered back in your uh, algebra course. So that's the inverse problem. That's what we're working on tonight. <clears throat> These critical values are going to be important. <clears throat> This percentage here, in many cases, is going to be an important indication of when it is we might uh, make or discard certain assumptions. But that's a little bit down the road. So we use, take care of this inverse problem, we use the TI-84 tool called believe it or not, inverse norm. <clears throat> and with the inverse norm, what it is we do is we supply an area with a mean and standard deviation. Now, the challenge here is that there are a couple of versions of inverse norm out there, depending on what model of the TI-84 you have. And they work a couple of different ways. Uh, the newer ones are very, very user-friendly. And you'll see me use that in just a moment. The older ones are a little bit less so. In any case, inverse norm is the tool that we, uh, that we use. Now, <clears throat> So, as I say, we consider a distribution. We have a mean of zero, a standard deviation of one, and I'm looking for this Z score right there. And just like that previous problem, uh, the area is equal to 0 0.1010%. .10%. So <clears throat> very much like that other picture. I mean, we're gonna use the same pretty pink. There it is. <clears throat> That's a job for my calculator. Now I'm gonna jump over to my calculator. We're gonna take care of these keystrokes <clears throat> and we'll go on from there. All right, let's see, share, share. Oh, you can see I've been playing. <clears throat> Let me get rid of that. So <clears throat> we go back to distributions and I see inverse norm right below the uh, normal CDF uh, function. <clears throat> the area, 0 0.10. 
my mean is zero, my standard deviation is one. And my calculator asked me which tail I might be interested in. The left tail, the right tail. By the way, I never use the phrase center tail, but I know what they mean there. And we'll talk about that on the next example or two. So, <clears throat> I can go ahead and paste that into my function there. Hit enter. And I get a 0 0.28155 There's a 1.282. There's no real hard and fast rounding rule for Z's. I have found that, uh, <clears throat> I have found that um, three decimal places is pretty much a sufficient for all of our good work this semester. So I start with the area and I end up with the <clears throat> z-score and I've used inverse norm, uh, <clears throat> inverse normal as I like to call it, no one's listening. It says inverse norm, but there we go. So that truly is uh, the set of keystrokes that we need. So let me stop my sharing. And, and again, really truly try to emphasize this inverse norm is where I take and I convert area <clears throat> to a, a Z score. And I will summarize this and uh, put it into some contrast with uh, the other tool we were using last night uh, when we get near the end of the uh, show. <clears throat> So we're going to uh, run through a couple of keystrokes here to just play around with that a little bit. And then I'll talk about the uh, other, uh, <clears throat> other way you might view your uh, results here, depending on your calculator, out, uh, your, the calculator version you have. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> so we are going to go ahead for all these examples. We pick a random Z score. And I'm going to look for the probability <clears throat> the first one, Z is less than, <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, I'm going backwards. Scratch that, I was doing last night's uh, work. <clears throat> Let me try that again. So <clears throat> critical value, there we go. So we're going to find the Z score. There may be more than two. Um, you're gonna see why drawing the picture is gonna help here. <clears throat> so we're gonna find the Z score. The first one is, separates the lowest 5% from the rest. <clears throat> Critical value, we're gonna find that z-score that separates the lowest 5% from the rest. And a very quick picture really does help. Now, a question that I often get, <clears throat> from students is which way is low? This is a number line. We got a zero <laughs> in the middle. We got a negative on the left side. We got positive numbers going off on the right side as far as the eye can see. <clears throat> so low is over here on the left-hand side. That's the low side, it's the negative side. And we're looking for the Z-score that separates the lowest 5% from the rest. So the area there is 5% or 0 0.05. I don't want to use 5%. I need <clears throat> I need my decimals. So let me come back over to my calculator.
distributions, find my inverse normal. This time it's 0 0.05 and I've got a left tail <clears throat> picture. So there we go. And I get a negative 1.648, uh, 1.6448 and change, negative 1.645. So, <clears throat> the area of 0 0.05 on the far left corresponds to a z-score of negative 1.645. Now, let's take a look at one where we're going to get two critical values. We're going to find the z-score. This time there's two. The highest And Lois, 1% of scores from the rest. So, <clears throat> the highest and lowest, 1% of scores from the left. Now, in the olden days, I used to do this problem a little bit different than the way this tool is going to work for me. But a little bit of math is going to be needed. I've got a z-score there. And I've got one over here, highest and lowest. <clears throat> highest and lowest, 1%. Now, there's a couple of different ways of going about doing this. <clears throat> I'm going to show you two different ways. First is the notion of symmetry. <clears throat> if I need the highest and lowest 1% of scores or that, uh, that dividing line, <clears throat> I know that they're going to differ by a sign, plus or minus, blah, 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 but they're gonna be the same absolute value in some sense. So one way to approach this, let me come back to my screen and share. One way to approach this <clears throat> oh, Wrong tool. Oh dear, now we're interesting. Okay, hold on. <clears throat> wow. So normal CDF, <clears throat> zero point zero, excuse me, zero. There we go, zero point zero one, one percent. Same mean, same standard deviation. If I take a look and just look at the left tail, just the left tail, <clears throat> I get a negative 2.326. Now, I'm gonna come back to my other screen in just a moment. <clears throat> But before I do that, I'm going to check out my distributions, come back here to normal. <clears throat> and this time, I'm going to select center and paste. And uh, 
Let's see what I get. I bet you anything, I'm not gonna get what I think I'm gonna get. Yeah, see, I got some really weird numbers. I did get two numbers here. So let me tell you how this works. <clears throat> when you use uh, this particular tool on this particular version, when I select center, I've got to use 0 0.98. I've got 1% in each of my tails. That sounds weird, but I got 1% in each of my tails. That's 2% total. That means there's 98% stuck in the middle. And here you see negative 2.326 and change, and then a positive 2.326. You see two distinctly different numbers there. So 2.326 plus or minus are the values that separate the largest and smallest 1%. <clears throat> Let me try to make that clear on my picture here. <clears throat> now, as I say, the area of each of those tails is 1%. Now, here's the thing. When I did that the first time, you know, if I want to use just one tail here, that's okay because <clears throat> One of the important notions of a uh, normal distribution is the notion of symmetry. So if this z-score is a negative 2.326, this one over here, I usually don't write it, but I will this time to really, really emphasize that, that it's a positive 2.326. And by the beauty of symmetry, I can get to this value pretty quick by finding that one first. Or, and there's good reason to do this too, I can note that because, <clears throat> because we've got an area of 1% over here and an area of 1% over here, that means the total area in the middle is 98% or 0.98. That is in the center. <clears throat> so there's a couple of different ways you might want to parse the problem. Either way works, to tell you the truth. <clears throat> now, let me tell you a little bit about uh, the older versions of the TI-84. <clears throat> the older version works a slightly different way. The older version does this. <clears throat> Inverse norm works only, and let me start that again. That looks messy, I'm not sure that works. On some TI-84s, Inverse norm works similar to <clears throat> that binomial CDF tool. In other words, only from the left. <clears throat> so, on some of the older kind, for example, if you want a <clears throat> a 
if you wanted the largest 10% on some of those older calculators in the older binomial CDF, the picture is even more important. The largest 10% is over here. <clears throat> but my calculator, or at least some of the older ones, and I've got a couple of these, they only work on <clears throat> the area down here from the left to the right. <clears throat> so to find this particular Z score, I would have to put in area equal to 90% or 0 0.90. Where's my weird calculator? <clears throat> um, let's see. I'm not sure you can see that or read that. Let me actually just try to bring it up. Oh. No, that ain't going to work. That's terrible. <clears throat> <clears throat> so for this particular one, what I actually place into my calculator <clears throat> is this particular area there, <clears throat> along with the mean and standard deviation. <clears throat> uh, there are several videos uh, that demonstrate this uh, online on the Canvas course shell. <clears throat> I don't think I can get my online calculator to do that, act like an old one. <clears throat> but again, as I say, this area is calculated only from the left. So it comes in, as I say, I want some contrast here. There we go, that's perfect contrast. And <clears throat> that really kind of covers the notion of the two, uh, the two directions. So let me talk a little bit about a bit of a summary now. So, <clears throat> to find probabilities, scores go in, probabilities come out. <clears throat> And the tool that we use to do this is the normal CDF tool. <clears throat> to find scores, probabilities i.e. areas go in and scores come out. <clears throat> that is my inverse norm tool. <clears throat> it is vital that students keep the normal CDF tool distinct and separate from the inverse normal tool. You've got to read the problem carefully. It will always make it very clear whether you are to find a probability. <clears throat> It'll say something like, find the probability. <clears throat> and it'll be clear when it's asking for a score. It's going to say, find the score of some sort. <clears throat> it'll be usually that separates the highest from the lowest or something of that nature. 
probabilities are really straightforward in how they are uh, addressed and asked for. <clears throat> and um, that's really, uh, really about it. Now, before I go any further, I will note that these two tools are the same two tools that we use in 6.2. The real difference with section 6.2 <clears throat> is that the, uh, <clears throat> the normal distributions are real world applications, things like IQ, length of pregnancy, heights, things of that nature. Uh, but the keystrokes are exactly the same. The only thing that's going to change really are the <clears throat> mean and the standard deviation. Normal distributions pretty much all look the same. If you take away the scale, they all have an area of one, the mean right there in the center at the top of the hill. So I'll get started on the 6.2 material uh, tomorrow. And I'll also start talking about uh, some of the uh, theoretic detail that is coming down the pike. <clears throat> That's going to be super important at the end of chapter uh, six, and it sets the stage uh, for everything we do in inferential statistics. <clears throat> it's a little intimidating, but I swear, if you can make it through the uh, 6.4, <clears throat> it only ends up being a handful of questions over the course of the semester. It really does become quite easy to use. So let me go ahead and stop my recording.